Now you're ready for the third element, God as sovereign. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. This is uh, so obvious, it really doesn't need much of an explanation. But here is our Lord preparing these disciples to live and proclaim the gospel in a completely hypocritical, corrupt, and apostate form of Judaism, surrounded by a world that knows nothing about Him, nothing at all, nothing about the Old Testament, nothing about the gospel. How are they ever going to make any advance? He says, here's a simple request, your kingdom come. God, do whatever advances your kingdom. That's the heart of true prayer, okay? That's the heart of true prayer. That's what we ought to be praying now, right? We've had enough of the kingdom of Satan. We've had enough of the kingdom of darkness. But are we praying for His kingdom to come? The Talmud said that the prayer in which there is no mention of the kingdom of God is not even a prayer. That, that was known theologically but not implemented as hypocritical prayers were in and of themselves self-congratulatory and self-promoting. We need to pray that His kingdom would come. How does His kingdom come? Pretty simple, one soul at a time. His kingdom advances one soul at a time, one believer at a time. That's what we need to be praying for. All these people who call themselves Christians who are caught up in all this social nonsense and turning people into haters, trying to promote rearranging life in a fallen world by making speeches to each other should silence their mouths and go before God and ask Him to bring His kingdom. You say, will God answer that prayer? Listen, the church is the answer to that prayer. This is His kingdom. And I will tell you this. Over the last year and a half, the Lord has advanced His kingdom, certainly in this place. While everything else seems to be going the wrong direction, this place is definitely going the right direction. So the prayer is, let Your kingdom come down. Let Your kingdom come to earth. Bring your kingdom, which means bring an advance of the gospel that brings salvation, that builds the church, because the church is where the kingdom of God on earth is seen. And this is a prayer that we need to pray with some importunity. You can never make a truce with evil. Well, look, we, we believe strongly in the sovereignty of God, but we, we don't make a truce with evil. We don't just sit by and watch whatever happens happen. We fight against evil. You can never be indifferent to the evil of this world. You can never be indifferent to the eternal damnation of lost souls. You can never be resigned to some passive attitude, some gray acceptance of the way things are. You can never let your theological clarity become theological comfort and stifle your zeal for the intercession that calls on God to reveal His saving power in the world. This kind of prayer is a rebellion. You want to rebel? Rebel this way. David Wells said, in an essence, rebellion, rebellion against the world and its fallenness, the absolute and undying refusal to accept as normal what is pervasively abnormal, 
It is in this its negative aspect, the refusal of every agenda, every scheme, every interpretation that is at odds with the norm as originally established by God. As such, it is itself an expression of the unbridgeable chasm that separates good from evil, the declaration that evil is not a variation on God, but its antithesis. We will never make a truce with evil. We will never surrender the biblical view of God. That's why Jesus said in Luke 18.1, at all times pray, do not lose heart. We need to pray for His kingdom to come. J.I. Packer said the prayer of a Christian is not an attempt to force God's hand, but a humble acknowledgment of helplessness and dependence. And I would add it's even more than that. It's an act of faith that believes that God works through our prayers.